these, uh, these past few weeks, uh, there's been some news about the International Space Station. I don't know how many of you have been keeping up. Uh, but the International Space Station has been making the news uh, lately. Uh, a few weeks ago, on August the 30th, uh, there was an, a leak in the International Space Station. Uh, the s- astronauts realized that they were losing oxygen levels very slowly. Uh, they were able to isolate the leak to a certain compartment, and once they isolated the leak to that certain compartment, they started searching in that compartment to figure out where exactly this leak was coming from. As slow as the leak was, it was no less a danger to their safety, a danger to their lives. And so they scoured the entire area, and finally, one of the astronauts finally found the source of this leak. The source of this leak was a two millimeter hole in the hull that had pierced the space station. This was a feel-good story a lighthearted story because of how it turned out. Uh, The story goes like this. One of the astronauts, the way they first plugged the hole was with their thumb. Disaster averted. Uh, Later on, they took some trustworthy duct tape, patched it up, and the next day they made some permanent repairs. It was found out that a micrometeorite had pierced the space Station. Uh, This piece of rock flying through space hit and pierced the space station, creating a hole, creating an oxygen leak. How important it is for us to be cautious and to be aware of external factors, of the things outside of us attacking in. How important it is to be aware of us, how we are leaking, how we're losing life, to take caution to protect against external dangers. Whether it's micro-meteorites or meteorites the size of Texas, like the movie Armageddon, we have to be aware of the enemy, aware of attacks, aware of external factors, chipping away at the fabric of our families, chipping away at accomplishing our goals, chipping away at our relationship with God and our faithfulness to obey Him. We must be cautious of external factors attacking us, breaking us down. Plot twist. Upon further inspection, it was realized that this two millimeter hole that had pierced the space station, it was not created from a micrometeorite puncturing from the outside in. Upon further inspection, it was revealed that the hole was created from the inside out. Based on shavings in the shape of the hole, it has been discovered that it's man-made, that someone drilled, not from the outside in, but someone from the inside drilled out. The damage was not caused by anything external or outside. The damage, the risk, was internal. Yes, we should be cautious of the enemy externally. Yes, we should be cautious of the things that are attacking our family, our faith, from the outside in. But all too often, the greatest danger is ourselves drilling holes from the inside. How often do we find ourselves sabotaging our own families, our own relationships, our own faith, puncturing holes in the hole, damaging relationships, hurting one another? What or how in your life are you your greatest danger? How have you been sabotaging your relationships, your family? How have you been sabotaging your relationship in faithfulness towards the Lord? Uh, This morning, we're going to investigate this particular thing. We're going to see three ways, three ways that we must be very careful of how we oftentimes sabotage our faithfulness, our obedience to the Lord. Uh, Yes, we should be cautious of external factors, but this morning in particular, What are three ways that we ourselves sabotage our own obedience to the Lord? 
This morning, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 27 this morning. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. You can find the book of John towards the right-hand side of your Bibles in the New Testament. Uh, The New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, If you see Acts, Romans, the Epistles, Revelation, you've gone too far. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. Uh, These past five weeks, we have been going through the book of John, looking at the I am statements of Jesus Christ. Throughout the book of John, as the gospel progresses, as Jesus moves closer to his crucifixion, he makes seven key I am statements. He takes physical things that we can relate to in order to spell out and to paint a picture of a physical and spiritual reality of his identity. We saw five weeks ago in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the gate of the sheep. And as well in chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. This morning, we'll see in John chapter 11 that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Throughout the book of John, we see a steady progression of the animosity towards Jesus Christ. There are Jews and different religious leaders. First, they're curious about Jesus. Then they reject Jesus, but they don't stop there. They start to conspire and to take him down and to plot to kill him. At the end of chapter 10, Jesus proclaims that he and God are one. He proclaims his own deity. He professes himself as the Christ, as the Messiah. And when he does this at the end of chapter 10, there are Jews there who grab stones and want to kill him there on the spot. But by God's providence and his timing, Jesus is able to escape and goes out away from Jerusalem, across the Jordan River. Here in chapter 11, we pick up as Jesus returns back to the area of Jerusalem. Uh, This animosity, this anger increasing, we see here in the text this morning, Jesus is only a few days away from his crucifixion and his own death. What are three ways that oftentimes we sabotage our own faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. Let's look at the first way, chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany was about two miles away from Jerusalem, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. We see that account in chapter 12. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Mary and Martha send a messenger to tell Jesus that Lazarus, he whom you love, this shows the intimacy and the closeness that Jesus has with this family. Lazarus has fallen ill, and so the sisters send a messenger to tell Jesus. Verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus has planned already, as we'll see in the next few verses, that he was going to wait for Lazarus to die, and then he'll raise him from the dead. So here, in verse 4, when Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death, Jesus is referring to he will be raised from the dead, and later on much more so. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That's comforting. Verse 7, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. 
But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to waken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. This word for sleep is used oftentimes in New Testament after Christ to refer to believers who have died. Sleep referring to this temporary state of death that to be raised and resurrected from the dead. Then Jesus told them plainly, verse 14, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What is the first issue, the first problem, the first tendency that oftentimes sabotages our faith in the Lord? What oftentimes sabotages our obedience to him. Oftentimes, we'll see what sabotages our faithfulness to the Lord, our obedience to him, is when we seek for God to do our will instead of us seeking to do his will. We sabotage our own faith when we seek for God to do our will instead of for us to do his will. In times of hurt and hardship, What do we want God to do for us? In term, times of plenty and health, of life and prosperity, why do we have health? Why do we have prosperity? Why do we have material things? We sabotage our faith. We want God to do our will, our way, based on our timing, instead of vice versa. At the beginning of chapter 11, We see what has happened. Lazarus has fallen ill. Mary and Martha send a messenger to Jesus. They seek for Jesus to heal and to save Lazarus so that he will not die. But what does Jesus choose to do? Instead of going immediately to Bethany, Jesus awaits two more days. It takes one day for the messenger to reach Jesus. But we see in later verses that by this time, Lazarus has already died. Jesus says he has already fallen asleep. It takes one day for the messenger to come and to tell Jesus. Jesus waits two more days, and it takes another day for Jesus then to travel to Bethany, a total of four days that Lazarus has died before Jesus goes to raise him from the dead. Why does Jesus wait, and why does he do it based on his timing? Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 4 tells us, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Then later on, when Jesus does decide to raise him from the dead, why does he do this? Verse 15, And for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. What is the purpose of God's will? The purpose of God's will is to glorify himself not us. The purpose of God's will is to bring pleasure and glory to himself and not us. Oftentimes we sabotage our obedience to the Lord when we think the purpose of God is to satisfy our own needs and to satisfy our will based on our own timing. Uh, This past Monday, it was uh, my wife Nellie's birthday, and the week prior to that, she had been uh, out of town uh, traveling for school. And on uh, that Monday, she would be returning her birthday, and I would be picking her up from the airport. So leading up to that Monday, uh, a lot of you were asking me, hey, what are you going to do for Nellie's birthday? Uh, And that, oh, that gave me a heart attack every time I was like, oh, what am I going to do? But I thought that was kind of a peculiar question, right? I thought that was painfully odd. Shouldn't it be painfully obvious that there's no need for me to get her anything else? (laughs) There's no need for me to do anything because I am the gift that keeps on giving. (laughs) 
Oh. She's blessed just to have me. I am the gift. I am the great blessing from the Lord given to her. You know, if anything, on her birthday, I would give her the blessing. On her birthday, I give her the gift of giving me a gift. I give her the great honor of spending time with me, of being with me, of having my undivided attention. Let's close in prayer. No. <laughs> that's not how I think. That's not how I operate all the time. If that were the case, how painfully arrogant would I be? If that were the case, how painfully prideful would I be? How ridiculous is it for me to place myself above another human being, let alone my wife? And if it's so crazy, if it's so unmanageable for us to do it to another human being, how crazy is it that we come with that attitude with God day in and day out? God, I read my Bible this morning. You're welcome. This morning, I come to Sunday service. God, I'm doing you a favor. This coming week, you owe me a solid, Lord. Okay, fine. Fine. I'll go share the gospel, but you owe me, God. You're welcome. I'm doing you a huge favor. God, I am blessing you by my near presence, by my very existence. God, you are so lucky that I even want to spend time with you. In time of great need and desperation, when you pray and plead with the Lord, in your prayer life, is it filled with you seeking the Lord satisfy you and to do your will? Or is it pleading with the Lord that you would have faith and surrender and obedience to still do his will? In your time of plenty, when Lazarus is finally healed, what was the purpose of that? It is not for Lazarus' glory. It's not for Mary and Martha's glory. It is not for the disciples' glory, but it is for God's glory. In our time of plenty, when we do receive material gain and things, in times where we are not left wanting, do we pound our chest and we say, look at me. I've done all these good things. Now look at my reward. Look at how much I've gained. Or even in our time of not lacking, our time of great material wealth, do we still seek to obey and to proclaim his name? Take a moment to reflect on your own life. Are you sabotaging your obedience to the Lord? When the going gets tough, when we lack understanding, are we still stubborn and we demand God to do things our way in our timing? Now, definitely during times of lacking understanding, during times of hardship, when we don't understand why God is doing certain things, yes, Go to the Lord in prayer. Yes, ask God to give you that wisdom. Ask God to give you that understanding that surpasses all understanding. Plead with the Lord. Lord, why are these things happening to me? But may your prayer at the end of the day be nonetheless, may I be faithful and obedient to accomplish your will. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. In your time of plenty, may your prayer be that you will not become distracted with the things of this world, distracted with your own pride and arrogance, but pray that you will not sabotage your own faithfulness to him, that you remain steadfast in your faith and centered on his will. 
to make sure that we do not sabotage our faith and obedience to the Lord, first and foremost, make sure that we seek to do God's will instead of seeking for God to do our will. Uh, secondly, in order that we do not sabotage our own faith, flock to obedience and not comfort. Flock to obedience and not comfort. Uh, let's see another barrier that the disciples have here in the following verses. Going back to verse 7 through 10. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. After receiving word from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is ill, Jesus waits across the Jordan River for two more days. After the two days, he then tells his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let us go to Bethany. Bethany being two miles away from Jerusalem, uh, being the hotbed of the conflict, being just where he had escaped from, where the people were trying to kill him. So what do the disciples say to Jesus? Verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? For the disciples, they're hesitant to follow Jesus. They're hesitant to go back to Judea because they're concerned about their safety. They're seeking safety and comfort. But what is Jesus' reply? Do not seek safety and comfort, but seek obedience to the Lord. Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the light, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This play with night and day, light and dark. Previously, we've seen that Jesus says that he is the light of the world. He exposes sin and darkness. If you walk according to the light, in other words, walk in obedience to the Lord, and you will not stumble. If you walk in obedience to the Lord, you will not get hurt? No. If you walk in obedience to the Lord, you will not suffer? No. If you walk in obedience to the Lord, no harm will come your way? No. If you walk in obedience to the Lord, you will not stumble, meaning you will not disobey the Lord. But those who walk in the night, walk according to the ways of the world, walk according to the passions of the flesh, they are the ones who will stumble. They are the ones who will disobey the Lord. The key to remaining obedient to the Lord is that we do not seek comfort and safety but we seek obedience to the Lord. Our barometer for how our relationship with God is going should not be based upon how comfortable, how safe we are, but it should be based upon how obedient we are to his word. Seek obedience, not comfort. A few years ago, uh, we went for a few years uh, for a summer mission trip with some of our youth and college students to Taiwan. And during the summer in Taiwan, it is painfully hot and humid. Uh, perhaps what's worse than being hot and humid outside in Taiwan uh, is going inside and being hot and humid in the still air. Uh, many of the places that we went in Taiwan uh, were more rural countryside areas, and so uh, there was no central heating or cooling. Uh, a lot of times when you went into a place, uh, they would just have a window unit if we were fortunate enough. And when you leave a room, you need to turn off the unit so you don't waste it. And so, of course, when you go back into a room, that means the unit is off and it's just hot, smoldering, and still stiff air, and it's just miserable. So the go-to move is this. As soon as our team goes into a room in Taiwan, the one priority, the number one we do, is to identify where the AC unit is. The first person who sees it, their responsibility is speed over to it, turn it to max, and the rest of the team, what do we do? We follow in line and we just flock to the AC unit and bask in the AC. We're so efficient. Man, it's like we're a SWAT team. It's like we don't even say anything. You know, we're just like... We know where to go. We flank left, flank right, and there we are. 
not exaggerating, right? So here, here's a picture, I think, of our 2013 team. Uh, all right. Uh, so we are at a train station in Taiwan. Uh, we are lined up in formation, two by two, not buying tickets as we should because the train's about to leave, uh, but we're seeking comfort. Uh, if you look to the far left of the picture, uh, you'll see some stripes. That is the AC unit. Uh, Kevin Wang did the good job. He found where it was and led us to the promised land. Uh, you'll see the rest of the team, you know, baby Steven. You see Howard's head right there. Uh, Nelly and Jenny, they're just a little off screen uh, right there. This is seeking comfort. Everywhere we go, our whole team, we just find the AC unit. We, we just worship it. We just, oh, man, it feels so good, right? We stand there. We waft. We just do this. The locals look at us like we're weird. But how good is it? And how do we go about seeking comfort? We go about seeking comfort. It's our number one priority. It's unspoken. We do it with such great efficiency, with such great effectiveness. We seek it with great joy, with great unity. We do it so well. We don't even have to say anything to one another. We're flocking right to it. As believers, individually, as a family, as community, as a local church here at PCAC, what would it look like for us to not flock to comfort, but flock to obedience in the Lord? Instead of flocking so efficiently, effectively, effortlessly to seeking comfort, what if as a church, nothing had to be said, nothing had to be done. We flocked like a SWAT team, everyone to their positions, and we flocked to seek and to save the lost. Instead of flocking to comfort, what if we flocked to the unreached, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who do not know the gospel? What if instead of so effortlessly and so willingly flocking to our own friend group and isolating ourselves, we flock to those who are unloved? Instead of flocking to our own family, to our own in-group, we flocked passionately, effectively, efficiently, quickly, earnestly, to those without family, to those who are unloved, to the orphans and widows? What if instead of flocking so quickly to maybe even the comfort of being here in this building, we went out of our comfort zones and we flocked to our neighborhoods, we flocked to the streets to share the gospel? Oftentimes we sabotage our own obedience to the Lord because it's so easy for us to identify the comfort, to go to the comfort, and to worship the comfort. Instead of sabotaging our faith and seeking after the comfort, take a moment to pause your next step. As you go to find that comfort, stop and pray for obedience. May we flock as a body to seek after obedience to the Lord. In our community groups and small groups, it can be that comfort to flock, to staying together, to remaining as is. But how uncomfortable yet obedient and good it is to multiply, to expand, to invite others in, to reach out. How convenient, how comfortable would it be to keep our own family, to keep our own PCAC family here for ourselves. And how uncomfortable and yet obedient it would be to send, to send one another to reach the nations long term. Oftentimes we sabotage our faith from the inside out when we seek for the Lord to do our will instead of His. Oftentimes we sabotage our own faith 
when we seek comfort instead of obedience. And thirdly, we oftentimes sabotage our own faith when we believe that our old life in sin is better than our new life in Christ. Let's look at verses 17 through 27. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 27, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. When Jesus shows up at Bethany, Lazarus has already died and been buried in the tomb for four days. Uh, next week, we're going to look at this passage again, breaking up into two sections because of the length. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, about the pain, the suffering of death. Uh, but here we see Christ promising this new life. Uh, Martha has the faith to know that Jesus as the Messiah, to know that as Lazarus, as a faithful follower of God, that there will be resurrection the last day. That because of the consequence of sin, all of us are to die once and for all and then to face judgment but for those who know Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, we're to face judgment unto a resurrection unto life. For those who don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, it will be judgment unto a resurrection unto death. Jesus says this, that he is the resurrection in the life, that whoever believes in him, though he die physically, all of us we will face this death, yet shall he live. Meaning after we die physically, we will have eternal life. He reiterates this again. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Though we will die physically, there is the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this new life in Christ is better than our old life in sin. Just as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, we who are in Christ will be raised from the dead on the last day. But even before then, in Christ, we are given a new identity. We are new creations in Christ. Even before our physical death, our lives are changed and transformed as different as night and day. In sin, we are dead. But in Christ, here, now, we are alive. Oftentimes, we sabotage our own obedience to the Lord. We go back to our old ways. We owe back to the old ways in our life of sin because we oftentimes believe that the old way is better than the new and obeying Christ. Believe that your new life in Christ is better than your old life in sin. We've spoken this several times before. I hope that we can adopt an I get to attitude about obeying God. Do you have to come to Sunday service? No. Now, before you get up and leave, none of us have to come here. None of us have to read the Bible. None of us have to pray to God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth. None of us have to love one another. None of us have to devote 
ourselves to meeting with one another. None of us have to reach the unreached. We get to do these things. It is our privilege to get to worship God. It is our privilege to get to read the scriptures. It is our privilege that we get to pray, to commune, and to have communion with God. It is our privilege to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Is an I have to attitude sabotaging you from a I get to life? If that's where you are this morning, perhaps as a follower of Jesus Christ, you feel it's a burden you don't want to carry. You feel that it's a nuisance. You feel like it's getting in the way of other things that you want to do. Then perhaps the prayer this morning is that you would not do these things out of guilt. You would not do these things out of compulsion. You would not do these things out of an unhealthy habit. But the prayer would be that you do these things out of joy. That you do these things as a result of your new life in Christ. You would do these things as a result of realizing it is better than anything you could do in this world. Each time before you sabotage your obedience to the Lord, before you say to yourself, ah, do I have to pray? If you're tempted to feel that way, before progressing and going on and doing that thing, take a moment to pray that God would change your heart. Before you come Sunday mornings, before you meet with one another in small groups throughout the week, if there's that inkling and you think to yourself, oh, again, I just did it last week. Believe me, I've had those feelings over and over again. Before you just go and dishonor God by going through the motions, take time that God would change your heart. Before you think to yourselves, do I really have to pray again? May you realize, no. That we get to know God. That we get to pray that we get to find peace, assurance, and understanding, not in ourselves, not in this world, but in God Almighty. I've been reloading and refreshing my browser, uh, you know, like every hour on the hour. I'm trying to figure out who done it. Who drilled this hole in the International Space Station? Maybe it was the Russians. Maybe it was the Italians. Maybe it was the Japanese. Maybe it's the Americans. There's some speculation. Maybe it was done before the International Space Station blasted off and went into space. Maybe it was done during manufacturing. Maybe it was done during somebody in the lab. Maybe it was done by somebody in the facility. Where has the sabotage in our lives begun? We are to be careful and to be cautious because it is very clear where the sabotage in our obedience to God has begun. The sabotage in our faithfulness did not begin last hour. It did not begin yesterday. It did not begin last year. But we must remain ever vigilant because the sabotage of our obedience to God began at the beginning of creation. The sin came through one man, Adam, and through him, the seed of sin spread throughout all man. That we came into this world as sinners. That is where the sabotage began. And as sinners, we continually sabotage our obedience and disobey the Lord. Each and every day, guard yourselves. Pray that you seek God's will and not our own. Pray that we would be obedient and not seek after comfort. And let us pray that we believe that life with Christ is better than our old life in sin. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. 
I ask and I pray that this will be a time of refreshing and renewal as we come before you. That we can come together after a week long of ministry in our schools, in our workplaces, ministry in our neighborhoods, ministry in our families. Ministry of small groups and in community and meeting with one another. Ministry of caring and bearing with one another. After a week long of being with people, dealing with problems, dealing with the messiness of being sinners, living in a fallen world. There's so many things that are sabotaging our faithfulness to you. So many things every step of the way that is getting in the way of our obedience. But Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the scriptures, for giving us your word, for allowing us to know you. Let's take a moment to reflect on his word this morning. I ask that the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin and righteousness to open up our hearts, our ears, our minds to understand the ways in which we are disobedient to you. Let's take a moment to reflect on the ways, the ways in which we have come to you, Lord, not seeking your will but our own. Let us examine our prayer life, our requests to you. How have we requested for you to do our bidding? How have we requested that you accomplish our will for our sake, our way, based on our timing? May instead we pray that we surrender our will. And in hard times and in good times, we seek to know what it means to obey your will. That we may do what you desire so that your name would be glorified. Let's take a moment as well this morning to reflect on the different ways we have flocked to comfort and safety. How have we been evaluating whether or not we have been faithful to God based on how comfortable and safe we are? Has there been times in our life where we say to ourselves, I feel so comfortable, I feel so safe. Therefore, I must be in God's good graces. May we not use that false measure. Instead, may we judge our faithfulness not on our comfort or discomfort in this world, but may we judge our faithfulness based on how obedient we are to obeying His commands. How consistent are we living according to the Scriptures? And lastly, this morning, let's reflect on how we have been trying to obey the Lord, but done it spitefully, done it angrily, done it begrudgingly, done it kicking and screaming all the way, resisting. Lord, I know this is a struggle for myself as well. That this is a constant battle. But instead, may you give us a new spirit, a new life, to take joy in all the things we get to do in your name. And with Father, I pray and I thank you I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.